on every hand lifted every mouth be giving praise unto our God come on why don't you begin to speak what you want God to do today Lord I ask you to allow your allow your spirit dear God to direct every word of our speakers today dear God Lord every heart that walks into this building today God let it be a prepared heart dear Lord to receive your word dear God every individual every man every lady every pastor every young person dear God every pastor's wife Lord we thank you today dear God for your presence that's already been saturated in this place starting from on Tuesday dear God we thank you today dear Lord for what you're doing and what you're gonna do today dear God come on why don't we lift our hands let's lift our voices today come on it's 1001 we're gonna start right now the next few seconds but before we start why don't we just lift our voices and just begin to magnify God. Let's begin to create an atmosphere for the supernatural. Let's begin to create an atmosphere for the power of God to set in here today. Come on, let's begin to prepare a place for those that are even not here yet so that they walk in, that they know that this place has been prepared with prayer today. Come on, one more time. Let's lift them up today. Oh, we exalt you today, dear God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus name, Jesus name. Come on, want to clap our hands into the Lord. Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Thursday camp meeting, the morning session. We're glad you are here. Why don't you tell somebody next to you, I'm glad you showed up this morning. And we're going to activate our voice and tell them you're going to receive a word from God this morning. Amen. There's nothing like camp meeting. There's nothing like camp meeting. And I want to let you know you are living the best life. If you live for God, you are living the best life. I tell that to my kids at least once a week. I just want to let you know you're living the best life. It's not what your friends are doing. It's not what's happening on social media or those different avenues. But living for God is the best life. Anybody believe that today? If you don't think you're living the best life, you need to experience God. Because you haven't experienced him yet. Amen. Come on, let's worship with him this morning. Let's worship with the praise team today. And let's just thank him for what he's doing, what he's already done, and what he's going to do. One more time, let's lift our voices. Let's lift our hands. God, we ask you to flood your presence into this place. God, every song, every word, every saint. Lord, we bless your name this morning. Praise the name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the Somebody lift up your voice, we've come to 
proclaim, we proclaim the name. Oh, yeah. The song says every nation, every nation, all creation. That's you and I this morning. We proclaim.
him. Come on, why don't we give him a praise that he deserves his aid? Come on, why don't you give him a praise that he deserves this morning? Come on, I know you stayed up late, but he still deserves our praise. Come on, he deserves our praise this morning. Oh, we thank you today, dear God. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah is the highest form of praise. Shout it again. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, clap your hands, all you people. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Once again, welcome to Thursday morning camp meeting. It's a delight to be here. And uh, we're going to just go ahead and go move on forward. Our first speaker is Brother Eli Lopez. And you're going to be blessed this morning. You're going to be blessed this morning. It was earlier this year that he came and preached there in Fresno with us, and he, he blessed our church. And if you open up your heart this morning and you receive the word that's from God, I know that Brother Lopez prayed, prayed. I walked in this morning, and he's back in the back just laying out praying because he wants to make sure that any time he walks through this pulpit, that's a word from God. Amen. As he comes, let's lift, let's lift our hands. Let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our hearts for the seed to fall on fertile ground. Lord, you see my heart. God, I want to prepare it right now for the word that you have. Now how I want to hear it. Now how I want to receive it. God, but what you want me to hear, what you want me to see. Come on, let's lift our voices. Come on, as he comes one more time. Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and uh, what a wonderful camp meeting we are already having. Uh, my prayer is that God would bless every service and every session, and he has absolutely done that. And he has fed us, he has strengthened us, he has encouraged us, he has challenged us. And I give honor to uh, Brother Cantrell, Brother Cantrell, I apologize, I need to say it correctly, Brother Cantrell, and Brother Fair and the entire district board, it is an honor uh, that they would allow me to speak in this session. And I give honor to all of you. And uh, give yourselves a hand. There's nothing like the family of God, the body of Christ. And, uh, and today I give honor to my pastor. Uh, my pastor, your pastor, our pastors, their job is not to tell us what we want to hear. Their job is to tell us what we need to hear to make it to heaven. And I've got a pastor. He'll do it with the best of them. And so I honor the man of God in my life today. Uh, I, many of you know, I, I teach at uh, a Bible college, Christian Life College. And uh, yeah. And so uh, I'm going to go teacher mode on you today. And I'm going to invite you to open up your dictionary to the word struggle. And... Uh, if you look at the word struggle, there it could either be a verb or a noun. We're going to look at the noun form, and it is a war, a fight, a conflict, or a contest of any kind. It is a task or goal requiring much effort to accomplish or achieve. So for a few moments today, I want to talk to you about the blessing of the struggle. The blessing of the struggle, and if I were to give a subtitle, it would be four treasures in your trial. 
for treasures. Lord, have your way in every life and in every heart. Speak to your people and let the perfect will of God be done. Let the gifts of the Spirit be in operation today. God, encourage and strengthen your people and be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. And I do give honor to Brother Graham and, and Brother Shock, both tremendous men of God, and we are blessed to have them with us this week. Uh, I, I enjoy uh, going on vacation. I enjoy getting away and going uh, on trips, and I like going to warm weather places. My wife and I, we always try to go someplace where it's not cold, where it's not rainy. We like uh, warm weather places. Summer's my, my favorite season. So I want to talk to you about a place that, that I discovered, um, and, and it sounds like, like paradise. It is the largest national park in the contiguous United States. It is home to an interesting variety of plant and animal life. It has majestic mountains and deep valleys. The winters are mild and calm. It sounds good. It's almost always sunny, dry, and clear. Sounds like paradise. Sounds like the place I, would, I don't want to hang out at. I don't like rain. I don't like storms. I don't like the cold. It's almost always sunny, dry, and clear. Friend, welcome to Death Valley. You see, without rain, your life becomes a desert. If every day is a sunny day, and there are no storm clouds, and it doesn't rain upon you from time to time, then, friend, your life is going to be a desert. So I'm going to pick up right where Brother McDonald left off yesterday. The exact passage that he ended with is where we'll start today. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. And just remain seated. I know many times we go to the Word, people will stand. Uh, I'm, I'm in teacher mode right now, so we're in a, a great big classroom here at the Santa Cruz Fairgrounds. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Verse 25. And the rain descended. And the floods came. And the wind blew. And beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Uh, there are so many directions you can take when looking at that passage, but this is the point I want to bring out today, that in your faith journey, rain is an inevitable event. Rain is an inevitable event in your faith journey. Friend, it's going to rain. As much as you want the sunshine, as much as you want summer year-round, as much as you don't want troubles and you don't want trials and you don't want difficulties, friend, I promise you the rain is coming. And if you're not in a storm today, just hold on. One day, the storm clouds are going to roll in overhead. You're going to look up. The rain is coming. It's an inevitable event. But here's the question, do you have what it takes to make it through the storm? And Jesus presented in this parable, one individual did not have what it took, while the other did. Do you have what it takes to make it through the storm? Now, uh, we were sitting down uh, before lunch yesterday, and it was, it was Brother Shock, and it was Brother McDonald, and I, and, and we all have a mutual friend. Uh, his name is, is Brother Laird Silliman, and uh, Brother Laird Silliman is, is a vice president at Christian Life College, and he's one of my best friends in the world, and so we talked about him, and, and just, we were kind of bragging on him, what an apostolic man of God he is, what a Christian him and his wife are, and then Brother McDonald commented 
on, on Brother Silliman's discipline. Because if you know Brother Silliman, this guy is, he's, 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 we used to say yoked. Now young people say swole, you know. But, but he, he's, he's, he's ripped. He's, he's, got, he's got muscles that, you know, I, I wasn't sure that they were part of the base package of the human body. He's got them. He's got the upgraded model. I mean, he's, he's got muscles on top of muscles. And, and I was shocked one day, though. I was shocked. And all I, when the, the day that Brother Silliman showed up to Stockton many years ago, all I've ever known is the, the, this buff, yoked out, just strong, manly man. That's all I've ever known. And one day I was talking with Sister Angie Silliman, and she told me that when she met Laird Silliman, he was skinny. So skinny Laird. And I couldn't picture it. Like, it, it hurt my brain to think about skinny Laird Silliman. Now, I've been trying to get him to come to camp meeting for years. And this is me getting him back for not coming to camp meeting. So next year, he better show up. Otherwise, his picture will be on the screen. I could not imagine skinny Laird Silliman. I just, it just, it hurt my head, it hurt my brain to think about it. Because the only Laird Silliman I know is, is this Laird Silliman, the, 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 the buff one, the strong one, the, the muscle man. This is, this is the Laird Silliman I know. When he sings, you better dance. I'm scared not to. When he preaches, I come to the altar. I'm scared not to. This is a, this is a man. But you know what took skinny Laird Silliman to strong and yoked out and swole Laird Silliman? Something called resistance. Because that's all a weight is. When you go to the gym and you pick up that, that dumbbell or that barbell, all a weight is is resistance applied to your muscles. That's all a weight is. It's resistance. And here is a simple fact for life. The greater the level of resistance, the stronger you become. And some of you thought God was angry with you. God was upset with you. God was somehow judging you because you have felt resistance. But don't you know God is preparing you. God is building you. God is orchestrating your ministry in your life for the great things he has prepared before you. But he knows you need the muscles to handle handle that you need the spiritual strength to handle that you need to grow in the Holy Ghost into new areas of authority so he has sent resistance to build you to prepare you for what is before you the greater the level of resistance the stronger you become so here's treasure number one that you will find in your trial. The struggle makes you stronger. But, but let me qualify that. Let me qualify that. If you respond right, the struggle makes you stronger. If you respond right. The lesson of the butterfly. You've heard this before, but allow me to share it with you again. A man found a cocoon of a butterfly, and one day a small opening appeared. He sat and watched the butterfly for several hours as it struggled to force its body through the little hole. Then it seemed to stop making any progress. It appeared as if it had gotten as far as it could, and it could go no further. So the man decided to help the butterfly. He took a pair of scissors and snipped off the remaining bit of the cocoon. The butterfly then emerged easily, but it had a swollen body and small, shriveled wings. The man continued to watch the butterfly because he expected that at any moment the wings would enlarge and expand to be able to support the body, which would then contract in time. But neither happened. In fact, the butterfly spent the rest of its life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings. It was never able to fly. What the man in his kindness and haste did not understand was that the restricting cocoon and the struggle required to get through the tiny opening were God's way of forcing fluid from the body of the butterfly into its wings. It would then be ready for flight once it achieved its freedom 
from the cocoon. It was the struggle that would enable it to fly. And without the struggle, it spent its short, pathetic existence, dragging itself on the ground, unable to soar, because somebody took away the struggle. James 1 verse 2. You know, there's some verses in the Bible. They, they're, they're easy to preach. They're hard to live. And I'm going to read this from, from the, the New King James. I, I like the rendering in that version. It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Man, I can get in the pulpit and preach that to you. But when the storm is hitting my life and I still have to get up and clap, and praise, and worship, and shout. Easier to preach, harder to live. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How can I do that? Verse 3, knowing you have to have this knowledge, you have to have this understanding. The trial has not been sent to destroy you. That's not the purpose for the storm. Knowing that the testing of your faith. I'm a teacher and I teach and then I have to give students a test to see if they've learned the lessons. And so many times what we are enduring are the test. God is seeing, have you learned the lessons I've been trying to teach you? The testing of your faith. And it produces patience. We think of patience today as like the ability to wait. Like you got to just have patience, wait. But really the Bible concept of patience is endurance. It's starting and not stopping. It's not quitting. It's not giving up. It's not throwing in the towel. It's you started this journey and you're going to see it all the way through. And the testing of your faith, it produces endurance. It puts something inside of you. It takes the quit out and it puts strength in. Verse 4, but let patience have its perfect work. Let this endurance get in you and do what it's supposed to do, that ye may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see, I want that last statement in verse 4. I want to lack nothing. But do I want the process to get me there? I'm going to read that verse again from the New English Translation. This is what it says. And let endurance have its perfect effect. So that you will be perfect and complete. Not deficient in anything. I, I have rubbed shoulders or interacted. Had fellowship with, with ministers. And, and so many times what is expressed is they feel so deficient in their ministries. They don't know if they are equipped to do what God. God has called them to do. They feel deficient to reach their city, deficient to fulfill the call of God. I've had some people tell me they almost feel like imposters. What are they doing trying to do this great work for God? They don't know if they have what it takes. Friend, if you will let God work the process, if you will understand the purpose for the storm and the resistance and what has, has hit you is not to destroy you, but God is forming you because he's going to bring you through so that your ministry will be deficient in nothing. So when you stand in the pulpit that anointing that you need that authority that you need you'll be able to stand there and you'll know you're the man of God that he's called you to be for your city God doesn't want you deficient in anything and so there's a process that he works to position us and to equip us so the treasure the first treasure the struggle makes you stronger if you respond right how does it make you stronger? Well, I know the, 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 the struggle builds your faith. Because when God comes through for you, you know this, the test becomes a testimony. You've got a story to tell. The struggle will build your faith, and the struggle absolutely builds your character. Talk to the elders among us, those, those people of high character that we revere. And have them tell you their story. It's not all sunny days. And it's not all good times. But their faith was tested along the way. And they came through that. And there's a strength to their character. We want it. We want to touch it. We want to be around it. But we don't always want the process 
for it to be produced in our lives. The struggle makes you stronger. Job 23 verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me, when he hath tested me, I shall come forth as gold. We all understand or we've heard preached, no doubt, the purification process for gold and the high temperature that, that is needed to remove the impurities out of gold. And that's what Job's referring to. He's going to Test me in the fires of adversity. But at the end of this process, I'm going to be like that pure gold. There's going to be value and worth. So the second treasure is this. The struggle purifies. If you respond right, the struggle purifies. Consider this. Beginning in Exodus 32... That's where we have the story of the golden calf. The children of Israel consistently struggled with idolatry. It was just their story, their history. Through, throughout the entirety of the sojourning in the wilderness and the kingdom years, Israel and Judah repeatedly fell into idolatry. And, and the time frame for that is around 1446 to 586 B.C. During this time frame, they consistently, they would do good. They would get a good leader. They would have a good king. God would raise up a righteous judge. And they would kind of come back for a season. And then, then it's, they would consistently just go back and worship the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the Moleks and, and so on and so forth. They consistently fell into the sin of idolatry throughout this time period. For 860 years, they had a sin issue that they seemingly couldn't resolve. In 586 B.C., Babylon destroys Jerusalem and, and the temple with it. And Judah is taken into captivity. In 538 B.C., King Cyrus of Persia allows the Jews to return and to rebuild the temple. The second temple is finished in 516 B.C. And the Babylonian captivity officially ends. Remarkably, Seventy years of captivity produced something amazing. Israel never again fell into the sin of idolatry. After their return from captivity, after that season of correction, after that time away from their homeland and from their temple, you go through this Bible, you will never, ever, ever find Israel as a nation again ever falling into the sin of idolatry. Their adversity purified them. And it took something out of them that for 860 years they struggled with a sin issue that they could not conquer. And so God sent adversity. And on the other side of that adversity was purity. And the nation never again fell into the sin of idolatry. 1 Peter 1.6 In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Isn't it amazing how the Bible just speaks to us in, in just real life? You've been grieved by various trials. Verse 7 That the genuineness of your faith. I like the way that the New King James renders that. The genuineness of your faith. You see, if you're genuine, it means you're real. It means you have it. And that is what the trial is going to expose. It's going to expose if you're real or not. What happens when you squeeze the orange? The orange juice comes out. What happens when you get squeezed? What words are you saying? What attitude are you projecting? What happens when you put the tea bag in, in the hot water? It's going to produce tea. What happens when you get dropped into the hot water of that, that trial, that situation? Well, what, what's going to come seeping out of your life? That the genuineness, are you real? It's easy to, to project something that we're not. We have learned how to do that. 
But the trial is going to expose the reality of our faith, the reality of our character, the reality of our commitment. Do we really believe what this book says? Are we going to stay tried and true? Is there that commitment, that resolve in us that we say that we have? The trial is going to expose whether you're real or not. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it is tested by fire. The, the, the trial is a testing, and there's a purifying process. He said that it may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The struggle, if you will allow it, if you'll respond right, it purifies. And there are three areas, and, I, and the preachers that are before me today, you, I'm sure you could add to this list. But I've seen that the struggle purifies your attitude. It purifies your motives. And it will absolutely purify your conduct. Your behavior will change when you come out of the storm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Psalm 34, verse 17. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Everyone say troubles. That means that you and I, we're going to have some difficulties. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. It is the law of divine attraction that God is not attracted to what is whole. He is attracted to what is broken. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Those who are are whole have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. There's the law of divine attraction where God, it's like a magnet that pulls his presence. He is attracted to brokenness. He's attracted to it. And in that storm, and in that trial, and in that difficulty, when your heart is broken, when your dreams are broken, when your spirit is seemingly crushed, it's amazing how in those moments, that's when Jesus gets a little closer. You walk into the prayer room, and you don't feel like going into warfare prayer. You don't have the strength for that. You just sit there. And it's amazing how Jesus walks in and sits right next to you. He is nigh. He is near those who have a broken heart. Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. One one version says he regards the lowly. When you're in that low place, that's when you have the attention of God. You think he's forgotten about you. You think he doesn't know where you're at. You think that, that, that his promises are, are, are by the wayside. You're wondering what has happened and is it ever going to happen for me. You think that God has forgotten all about you. But friend, it's in the low place where he regards you. It's in the low place where you have his attention. He's watching you when you're in that low place. When you're in that place of brokenness. When you're not strong but, but you confess, God, I'm weak and I need help and I can't make it. And I need you and I need you to show up and Rescue me. He regards the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. See the distance here. Those who think they've got it all together, God keeps them at a distance. But those who are lowly, those who are in that weakened condition, he gets close. He's regarding. He's paying attention to you. Verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble. Everyone say trouble. Ah, that wasn't everyone. Everyone say trouble. Thou wilt revive me. Friend, it's not over for you. You may be down today, but you're going to get up tomorrow. It may be a a time of weakness today, but your muscles are getting built uh, so you can rise with strength uh, in all of your tomorrows. He's going to revive you. He's a reviving God. That's what God's doing for us this week. He's reviving his church. Uh, COVID couldn't keep us down. The government can't lock us down. There is a revival coming to the people of God. And in the midst of trouble, he shows up to revive his people. 
Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies. Look at that. He's going to push the enemies away. And thy right hand shall save me. Look at the word picture that's going on here. If God is pushing my enemies away and he is shielding me with his right hand, it means he's standing right next to me. Some of you are wondering, God, where are you at in the storm? He is right next to you, shielding you, strengthening you, protecting you, keeping you. He is right there. The third treasure is simply this. The struggle draws you closer to God. If you respond right. The struggle will draw you closer to God. Galatians 4.19, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Isn't that the goal? That when you look at Eli Lopez, you would stop seeing Eli Lopez and you would hopefully start seeing Jesus Christ. That, that's the goal. That Christ would be formed in us. In Romans 8, 29, Brother Tears, if you could just put one water bottle like right there and one water bottle just in front of one of those keyboards over there, just little markers. We'll do a visual here. In Romans 8, 29, it says, for whom he did foreknow, that's perfect, right there. For whom he did foreknow, I apologize if I called you by your first name on the platform. I apologize, Brother Gonzalez. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. I'm not going to get into the whole discussion of predestination. But what I want to highlight is, is that, that, that statement, conformed to the image of his son. It is God's plan that you and I become more like Jesus. That we become conformed to the image of his son. Okay, so this, this point on the platform marks the beginning of my salvation. The beginning of my journey with God. This is what's called justification. When I am put into right standing with God. This is when I get born again. I get saved. I am now in right standing with God. This is justification. The end of my salvation is called glorification. Right? This is the end goal. This is where I am forever in the presence of Jesus. This is when I've made it. I've crossed the River Jordan and I entered my eternal promised land. So it starts at justification and it ends at glorification. But the process from justification to glorification is called sanctification. That is the process where we become like Jesus. What did John the Baptist say? He, he said it best. He said, I must decrease, but he must increase. And when I start out at this point of the journey, there's a whole lot of Eli Lopez, and it's not very good. And so as I walk through this journey, the goal is by the time I get to the end, there is much more of Jesus Christ and a whole lot less of Eli Lopez. But along that journey, there are going to be storms and trials and testings and difficulties because the process of sanctification is to confirm form me to the image of the sun and I can't always be conformed on a sunny day. Sometimes the storm clouds have to roll in. Sometimes the downpours have to shower upon me but God has a purpose. He is getting me to a place of glorification but along the way he is conforming me to his image. <laughs> Philippians 3.10 I have a high view of scripture. I believe the Bible is the inerrant and infallible word of God. Absolutely believe it. But there are some verses I kind of wish they just kind of maybe cut off halfway through. This is one of those verses. I wish Philippians 3.10 said something like this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, period. I wish it ended right there. Paul, oh, why'd you have to keep writing? He had to keep writing because he was inspired by God. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If you want to be like Jesus, then you have to be willing to suffer like Jesus. You see, you can't really say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do until you have been unjustly nailed to a cross. 
You don't know the power of those words until someone's lied about you and someone's tried to crucify you. All of a sudden, you'll realize what Jesus meant, what it cost him to pray that prayer. And if you want to be like Jesus, then, friend, he suffered. Don't be surprised if there are some difficult places on the journey where his nature is going to be formed in you. And you're going to have the opportunity to either respond bitter or get better and you can say father forgive them I refuse to get bitter I refuse to get bent out of shape but I'm going to let you mold me and shape me and conform me to your image so the fourth treasure is simply this the struggle conforms you to his image if you respond right if you respond right the struggle will conform you to his image. I know for all of us, uh, this, this past year has, uh, has been challenging. And uh, in, in some ways for me, and I'm not trying to be melodramatic or in any way play the victim, but, but almost for me, COVID has almost been in the background. It's just some other challenges facing in life and, and in ministry and, and uh, some wounds and some hurts along the way. And I've endeavored to, my wife and I, just to keep our spirit right. I listen when Bishop Moling says being a little bitter is like being a little pregnant. In a few months, that, that woman who's a little pregnant, she's going to get very pregnant. And if you let in a little bit of bitterness, it won't stay little. You're going to become very bitter. It will destroy you. It will be an acid that will eat you from the inside out. So gone through some times and some testings and this whole process of, man, God, can, can I get a sunny day? Uh, can, 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 I, can I get a little break? And sure enough, a few days of sunshine will come through and it seems like another storm rolls right in. And right at the beginning of this season that I'm referencing, and I'm not giving details or anything like that, but. I got a text message from a man of God, Brother Anthony Cox in Chicago. And he sent me a text message. I was in prayer, and I felt to share this. We actually saved the screenshot. This was on January 5th, 2020. He didn't know I was in the midst of a storm. He didn't know that the rain drops were falling pretty heavy on me. And he sent me 1 Peter 1, 7, the, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold. So I called him up. I texted back. said, do you have time to talk? Just wanted to hear a friendly voice and, and get some spiritual counsel and got on the phone he said brother lopez i had another verse to share with you and uh i didn't know how to put it in text message uh okay he said uh hebrews he said the son though he were a son yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered he said i don't know what that means to you it was something I didn't want prophesied over my life. It wasn't the word of the Lord I was looking for, but this incredible peace came over me. And God filled me with an awareness that there was purpose for the suffering and purpose for the testing and purpose for the storm. There were things God needed to teach me. There were things God needed to show me. There were things God needed to strip out. And it's amazing, through this season, I, I've always valued prayer, but I, I told someone through this past year and a half, I, I've, I've, and I don't mean this in a, in a braggadocious way, and I think you'll get my spirit, I just became addicted to the prayer room. It's the only place that you could find relief sometimes. And I would just go, and I wasn't having these monster prayer meetings where I was screaming and yelling. Every now and then, I would just sit there, and I would talk to Jesus for, for a couple hours, and he, I don't know if he was listening, he probably got tired of hearing everything, but I know he was there with me. Got, got addicted to the prayer. And, and Brother Gonzalez, you know what I found? Prayer didn't always change my circumstances, but it always changed me. It always changed me. And it's amazing. I'd walk in that prayer room, and, and, and I'd want to pray about him, and I'd want to pray about her, and I'd want to pray about that. And God would just hold up a mirror and show me all kinds of ugly that was in here. Things that were not like him. Things that did not please him. And a good friend of mine who's been kind of aware of 
this journey we've been on, I, I told him, I said, I wouldn't trade the past 18 months for anything. And he said, how, how can you say that? Because I'm a different man than before the storm started. And I have a question for someone today. Has God ever put more weight on you than what you could bear? Has God ever put more weight on you than what you could bear? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted ab above what you are able. This is the part we like. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape? You got to finish the verse. That ye may be able to bear it. Let me read that again from the, the New English translation. No trial has overtaken you that is not faced by others. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you are able to bear. But with the trial will also provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. You know the revelation I got this year, Brother Gonzalez? That my escape, my way out of the trial was getting through the trial. That was my way out. And I determined I am going to respond right. Because there are four treasures that money can't buy. And that you will only gain these treasures in the time of testing, you will only gain these treasures when the storm is raging. You will only gain these treasures through those dark nights and those difficult days. So here's my question as the music team begins to get back in place. What will your response be to the trials that God allows in your life. Because the rain is coming. It's an inevitable event. What will your response be to the trials that God allows in your life? Would you close your eyes and in this holy atmosphere, would you reach a hand? Reach that hand towards him. I prayed, I've been praying for this service, and I knew God would have me teaching, but I also prayed that there would be a release of the gifts of the Spirit, that words of encouragement, that words of faith would come to God's people. Oh, I feel that holy presence. Would you stand now? And with both those hands raised, would you just, would you reach out to him? Pastor, he hasn't forgotten about you. Man of God, he knows right where you're at. Saint of God, you're going to make it through. You're going to make it through this storm. Can someone lift up their voice? Would you lift up your voice right now? I feel the Holy Ghost in such a special way. God is ministering strength and encouragement and faith to his people. If it's appropriate, would you just reach over and, and pray with someone next to you? I, there's a man of God, you, you may not know it, but God knows it, he needs some encouragement today. There's a woman of God today, she, she just needs to know that it's gonna be okay. There's a saint of God. They just need to feel that strength of God today.
Brother Garza, if you would put the very last slide on the screen, the blessing of the struggle. The four treasures. You'll be stronger in faith. You'll be purified in spirit. You'll be closer to his presence. And you'll be conformed to his image. And this is the most odd way to end this type of message. But James said, count it all joy. And so what we're going to do today, some of you are in the midst of the storm. It's going to be a little more challenging. Others of us, we've come through the storm. And so we're ready to release that praise. But we're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to count it all joy. So all across this sanctuary this morning, I'm wondering if we could lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving for the faithfulness of God, for the goodness of God. Oh, that's it, someone. Come on, praise your way through this storm. Count it all joy in the midst of the test. Count it all joy. That's it. Would you clap your hands? Would you lift your voice? And would you let the joy of the Lord be your strength today? surrender whatever they're going through Just give God praise for what he's doing in this place today. Oh, Jesus, we need you, God. Move through us, God. Send down your anointing in this place. Send your fire, God, Lord, to purify us, Jesus, of everything that's not like you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more time. Come on, let's lift our voice in this place. Who came for an outpouring of the Spirit today? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God.